hearing will come to order. Before we begin, this is an unusual hearing, and I hope you will all agree that this is a hearing in which we are not talking about any particular problem that has occurred in the recent or not recent past. We are talking about an ongoing question of the independence, the value of Inspector Generals, and where this committee should go in strengthening the 12,000 men and women, $2 billion budget that ultimately protects the taxpayers. So with that, I am going to make a, a special request, recognizing that votes will interrupt this hearing and make it probably impossible for us to get through two panels. I am going to make a request, uh, request that we be able to consolidate onto one panel. In order to do that, I am going to ask unanimous consent here on the dais that all members uh, agree not to get into areas that would create an inherent conflict between a transparency or sunlight individual, such as POGO, and the Office of Management and Budget. Do I hear any objections? Hearing none, uh, could we please consolidate this so that we can get through one panel? If anyone objects to questioning as somehow creating a conflict, I will rule on it. But my intention is that I believe everyone on the panel and everyone on both sides of the dais today wants this hearing to accomplish the same fact finding. So if the staff would, would get that done while we do the opening statement. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. In 1978, the position of Inspector General was established to promote efficiency and ensure that a threshold of accountability was integrated <coughs> uh, government-wide. I myself saw the Inspector Generals far before that when in the military, where their role for, for generations was critical. Commanders do the best they can. But commanders need watchdogs at all levels, independent watchdogs. The IGs are America's front line of oversight and ex in the executive branch. Fiscal year 2009 alone, their audits and investigations identified over $43 billion in potential savings. Having a robust group of permanent inspector generals at the Federal agencies is the best way to protect taxpayers from waste, fraud, and abuse. The Obama administration has often proclaimed its commitment to transparency and accountability. That is why it is so troubling, and I, I remember that the, his predecessor had similar situations and want to note that, that the President has allowed vacancies at several IG offices to linger for months and in some cases years. Even more disturbing, even more disturbing is the administration's willingness to demonstrate a pattern of, at times of hostility towards some members of the Inspector General community. That is not to say that that has not happened with past, past administrations. One of the President's first actions on the IG front was to remove IG Gerald Walpin from his post at the Corporation for National and Community Service. We in, on this side of the aisle objected to it and continue to feel that this was inappropriate. However, that is not the issue for today. The issue for today is, in fact, how do we find something, regardless of who is in the White House, that satisfies, first, the American people's right to know and right to be protected from waste, second, strengthens the relationship between this committee and our counterparts in the Senate in being able to count on the Inspector Generals as our conduit into the executive branch. We can all have discussions about this administration, and we have had plenty and will have more. But I think when we look at exposing taxpayer loss and waste, we cannot look at any one administration. 
we have often on a bipartisan basis lauded the success of tracking the stimulus fund spending. It doesn't mean we agreed to the stimulus bill itself, but it means that, in fact, we saw Inspector General given a new job as chairman of that, and we saw his years of experience help him help us understand what we would do next to improve transparency in the Federal Government. Today, four IG posts have been vacant for more than 1,000 days. Five IG vacancies are at Cabinet departments. One of our points will, in fact, be to deal with such situations as uh, USAID's vacancy at a time in which Afghanistan and Iraq are not yet settled questions and the very ability of that entity to deliver its historic support rather than direct funding to indigenous uh, nationals without AIG or USAID direct oversight concerns us and would concern us even more if we cannot have an inspector general there. So in closing, I think it is extremely important not to allow <clears throat> today's hearing in any way to reflect on the current executive branch individuals, including President Obama and Vice President Biden. In fact, we need to look beyond that. We need to look to the question of, do we need to change the law for future presidents that would ensure prompt filling of vacancies in the absence of presidential action? Could SIGI or other entities have the right to temporarily fill those? If there is a dismissal, and I must admit I was tardy here because I was dealing with a potential false dismissal of an Inspector General today, the fact is, if that occurs, what is our ability to ensure that the acting Inspector General in that entity or agency is, in fact, independent? and that that dismissal is reviewed, or any other action, reviewed in a way that pre prevents any loss of the independence, no matter what the allegation is. As we all, as we all know, it is clear that inspector generals wear two hats. One of them is for the agency or the cabinet position they work for. They may or may not be presidentially appointed. They may or may not be uh, confirmed in the same way. That may be something that needs to be changed. But today we will primarily be dealing with and asking the question of how can we get greater independence and for this committee more consistent transparency uh, with, uh, be, to this committee and to the public. With that, I would recognize the, opening, the uh, ranking member for his opening statement. Mr. Ch Chairman, just a point of clarification, just one point. Um, the, the OMB, uh, I understand, has a policy of uh, Yeah, I, I recognize the OMB has chosen not uh, to be on this panel. We will we'll remove uh, the name. It, it may very well mean that he will be called back for a future that, hearing. That will be fine. They, they, first of all, it's not, it's not that they are unwilling. Just so it just sets another precedent, and they they will testify at any time. So they are glad to come back. Sure. No, I, uh, I have. Right. You know, it, it was a it was a, an ask for, and I had hoped that they would uh, view this as a time in which it would not be a problem. As you know, uh, administration selectively decides at times that they will sit with non-administration and selectively decides they won't. But ultimately, we'll respect their decision. Uh, we'll get through the first panel if there's time based on some change, but I suspect strongly there won't be and we will have to reschedule. That will be fine. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Right. I really appreciate that. Inspectors uh, General are critical to ensuring that our government works effectively and efficiently on behalf of the American taxpayers. And although our committee plays a prominent and often public role in conducting government oversight, we rely heavily on IGs to conduct audits, inspections, and investigations on a daily basis at Federal agencies. Our committee also plays a unique role in overseeing IGs and ensuring that they have the tools to do their jobs. In 2007, one of the most respected members of our committee, Jim Cooper, introduced H.R. 2928, the Improving Government Accountability Act, to enhance IG independence and efficiency. Under the then Chairman, Henry Waxman, the committee approved this legislation by a voice vote. The House and Senate then adopted it, and the bill was signed into law by President Bush in 2008. In my opinion, this is how we should approach today's hearing, by working together in a bipartisan manner to ensure 
that oversight is rigorous and constructive. Today we will discuss IG vacancies at Federal agencies. Right now, seven IG positions are vacant that require Presidential nominations and Senate confirmations. Although the President has nominated several candidates who are awaiting, awaiting Senate confirmation, he has yet to nominate others. In addition, an existing vacancy at the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction requires a Presidential nomination, but not a Senate confirmation. We all agree that we should have highly qualified, dedicated professionals in place at every IG office across the Federal Government. Personally, I am most concerned that the Administration has not nominated anyone to serve the State Department IG. The last Senate-confirmed State Department IG was Howard Krongod, and he resigned after an investigation by this committee into his conflicts of interest and his failure to conduct sufficient oversight of agency operations. That position deserves to be filled as soon as possible. To be fair, the number of current vacancies is not necessarily unusual. In fact, in the fourth year of George W. Bush's presidency, there were also seven vacancies for Senate-confirmed IGs, including at the State Department, Department of Treasury, and the General Services Administration, and the Department of Health and Human Services. And, and this does not include Clark Kent Irvin's recess appointment to serve as IG of the Department of Homeland Security, which was never confirmed by the Senate. The fact that President Bush had, had as many IG vacancies in 2004 as President Obama does today does not mean we should ignore the current vacancies. Similarly, we should not single out the current administration for purely partisan reasons. As part of our review today, we also have acknowledged, acknowledged the role played by the Senate in these vacancies. For example, President Obama nominated Michael Horowitz to be the IG of the Department of Justice on July 29, 2011. Until 2009, Mr. Horowitz had served as a presidentially appointed Senate confirmed commissioner on the United States Sentencing Commission. Yet, even though the Senate had confirmed him previously, his nomination was, was held up for eight months. When the, when the Senate finally did the vote, they confirmed his nomination by a voice vote. Similarly, Brian Miller, the current IG at GSA, who will be testifying here today, had to wait nine months before the Senate finally confirmed his nomination by President Bush in 2005. The IG vetting process is very extensive and challenging, and it becomes even more difficult to identify qualified candidates who are willing to serve when they are blocked by anonymous holes and under delays in the Senate, and undo delays in the Senate. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the hard work of those who serve in IG offices. This includes not only the thousands of staff who dedicate their professional careers to these tasks, but also those who serve as acting IGs while others await Senate confirmation. In fact, just yesterday, our committee heard testimony from the very capable acting IG at the Department of Homeland Security. Nobody should be under the misimpression that the lights are turned off at IG offices while they await a permanent IG. These officials and staff do a terrific job on behalf of the American people, and I commend them for their dedication. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. All members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. Uh, as I recognize the panel, I would ask unanimous consent that because we are not sure whether we will get to him, that the Honorable Daniel Werfel's uh, opening statement be placed in the record as though he did testify, without objection so ordered. We now introduce the Honorable Phyllis K. Fong, who is the Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Chair of the Council of Inspector Generals, or SIGI, as we will tend to call it here. Uh, we also a returning favorite, the Honorable Brian D. Miller, who is the Inspector General of the United States General Services Administration. Welcome back. And Mr. Jake Weens is the investigator for the Project on Government Oversight, often called POGO. Welcome back. Pursuant to the committee rules, I would ask you to please rise to take the sworn oath and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Uh, as I previously said, we are unfortunately today going to be on a very tight constraint because of votes. Uh, I will try to keep our folks to their five minutes. I would ask you to try to stay to your five minutes. 
And uh, I assure you, we will stay as long as we can on a vote and, if possible, return as soon as possible. With that, we recognize Ms. Fong for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee. It is a real privilege to be here today to represent the Federal IG community, which consists of 73 IGs in the executive and legislative branches. And at the outset, before I get into the topic of this hearing, I would like to express the appreciation of the IG community to you and the members of the committee for your continuing support of our mission and your interest in our work. This committee has a noteworthy record of bipartisan support for the contributions of IGs. And in particular, we note your work on the Data Act of 2012, which was recently passed by the House and which contains several provisions that would greatly assist IG operations if enacted. And so on behalf of the community, we want to thank you for your support. My written statement provides an overview of the IG Council's activities, so I am going to focus my remarks this morning on the role that we play as a Council in filling IG vacancies. As has been remarked, the process to fill vacancies involves multiple players and a thorough vetting process. And SIGI plays a very small role at the front end of this process. By law, we are responsible for submitting recommendations on potential IG candidates to the appropriate appointing authority, namely the President for Cabinet-level agencies and the agency head for smaller designated Federal entity IGs. To do this, we have set up an IG recommendation panel to receive materials from interested candidates. The panel is composed of experienced IGs who represent different kinds of IG offices who bring insight and experience to the process. With respect to the PAS IGs, the panel provides recommendations on an ongoing and continuous basis to the Office of Presidential Personnel so that that office can consider candidates as vacancies arise. When a vacancy arises in a DFE IG position, the panel contacts the appropriate agency head directly to offer its assistance in filling that vacancy. SIGI actively reaches out to numerous groups to publicize this process and to ensure that people who may be interested in IG positions understand the process that we play, the role that we play in the process, and that they are able to take advantage of that role. I should note here that while we do provide one source of IG candidates to appointing authorities, we are not the only source of candidates. For example, people who are interested in IG jobs can apply directly to the appointing authorities if they so desire. Also, our recommendations are not binding. They are not, the, the appointing authorities are not required to accept or to act on our recommendations when they make decisions on how to fill IG vacancies. Once we provide our recommendations, our formal role in the appointment process is over. Uh, we look forward today to continuing our work in this area, and we welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Inspector Miller. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here to talk, talk about the role of Inspectors General. My remarks today reflect only my personal experience. It is a great privilege for me to have served as Inspector General since being confirmed in 2005. And I recognize the tremendous responsibility that comes with this job. IGs wield a large amount of discretion and authority. They issue reports that can have a devastating impact on the agency and individuals. IGs make criminal referrals, often resulting in felony convictions and incarceration. IGs advise heads of Federal agencies and the Congress. We regularly appear at hearings such as this one and often meet with members of Congress and their staff. Perhaps most importantly, IGs need to navigate sometimes difficult relationships with their home agency as well as relationships with other IGs, agencies, prosecutors, and the law enforcement community as a whole. Part of the genius of our system of government is that IGs provide the needed check and balance on the operation of Federal agencies. Now, the usual incentives for taking a Presidential appointment do not apply to IG positions. IGs are not policymakers. 
They apply the laws and policies already on the books. They are not political. IGs have to be nonpartisan, fair, and impartial. Finding and nominating the right person for the job is absolutely vital. IGs have a dual reporting requirement to Congress and the agency head. As one former Inspector General, Sherman Funk, put it in the, in the fall 1996 issue of the Journal of Public Inquiry, dual reporting equates to, quote, straddling a barbed wire fence, unquote. Mr. Funk stated that because of the challenges facing IGs, the job must, must be done with sufficient common sense, a healthy dose of good humor, unremitting homework, support by professionally competent staff, and above all, a solid and reflexive integrity. Then the barbed wire fence may cut occasionally, but it will not disable. Based on my own experience, I believe that once selected and appointed, an IG needs time and experience on the job to develop, long-term audit and investigative priorities, the ability to hire highly specialized staff, and the independence to accomplish the mission. My permanent appointment allowed me the needed leverage and longevity to make lasting improvements to my office and to make long-term recommendations to GSA. Additionally, I believe my impact has been greater because I have been able to create longstanding relationships with agency officials, the Department of Justice, and the Congress. I have also worked hard to establish partnerships with State and local IGs and law enforcement as part of my duties with the Financial Fraud Enforcement Task Force. Examples of some of the steps I have been able to take are, include the following. In 2008, I formed the Office of Forensic Auditing to employ innovative auditing and investigative techniques and to develop evidence that meets admissibility standards for prosecution in Federal courts. In 2011, we began a criminal intelligence program to augment our investigative activities by consolidating our information gathering efforts and serving as a force multiplier for our special agents around the country. We have integrated our hotline into this program so that a trained investigative analyst looks at every complaint and tip to identify trends and connections to other open cases. Additionally, our partnership with, the, with FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, broadens our agents' ability to spot bribery cases and kickbacks. I appreciate the time and effort that went into confirming me as an Inspector General, and I hope that my efforts have served the interests of the United States. Thank you for your time, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Weens. Chairman Issa. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, thank you for inviting me. If you pull it just a little closer, that is probably why you are not hearing a little echo. Thanks. Sorry about that. My name is Jake Weens, and I am an investigator at the Project on Government Oversight, which is also known as POGO. From POGO's perspective, the Inspector General system is an essential component of a well-functioning Federal government. IGs identify billions of dollars in cost savings every year. They conduct investigations that hold government officials and contractors accountable for misconduct, and they help to evaluate the effectiveness of government programs and policies. Because POGO considers IGs to be so incredibly important, we regularly undertake efforts to strengthen and improve the IG system as a whole. Some of those efforts have focused on giving IGs the tools to be more independent, and other efforts have focused on the necessity of holding IGs themselves accountable for misconduct and poor performance. Our most recent effort to strengthen the IG system is a web page that we created called Where Are All the Watchdogs? The web page continually tracks the overall number and length of IG vacancies and whose responsibility it is to fill the positions. POGO created the IG Vacancy Tracker because we firmly believe that the effectiveness of an IG office can be diminished when that office does not have permanent leadership. IG offices that are led by permanent IGs have a number of structural advantages over IGs that are led by acting IGs. Some of those advantages are unique to the IG context, and others are general management concepts that could, could apply in basically any organization. One structural advantage of permanent IG leadership involves independence. Another advantage of permanent, or of permanent IG leadership involves credibility. 
Both of those qualities can have a huge determinant on the effectiveness or lack thereof of a particular IG office. As of today, 10 of the 73 statutory IG positions are vacant. Some of the positions have been without permanent leadership for years on end, while others only recently became vacant. Although the overall number of IG vacancies is important, the context surrounding particular vacancies is necessary to truly understand the implication of that vacancy. IG positions can become vacant for a variety of reasons, some of which are troubling, while others are completely appropriate. And in some occasions, a vacancy may even be bene beneficial. Likewise, IG vacancies can continue for extended periods of time for a variety of reasons. It is useful to look at some of the current vacancies to understand how they began, why they have continued, and what the implications of those vacancies might be. The State Department IG has now been vacant for 1,576 days, which is over four years. The position first became vacant when State's most recent permanent IG, Howard Kroengard, resigned amid allegations that he had been blocking criminal investigations into contractors operating in Iraq. The initiation of that vacancy created an opportunity to fill that position with a highly qualified and well-respected permanent IG who could restore credibility to that IG office. But that opportunity has not been realized as the position has remained vacant without a nominee since the last year of the Bush administration. The Corporation for National and Community Service IG position has now been vacant for 1,064 days. The position first became vacant in June 2009 when President Obama removed CNCS's most recent permanent IG. Gerald Wolpin under controversial circumstances. Since Wolpin's termination, the Obama administration has nominated two candidates for the position. The first was nominated in February 2010, but his nomination has since been withdrawn, and the second was nominated in November 2011 and has been awaiting Senate confirmation for 177 days. The continued vacancy, regardless of fault, comes at a terrible time for the CNCS IG because their budget was recently cut in half during the FY 2012 appropriations. The Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction position has now been vacant for 461 days. The position became vacant after the original cigar, Arnold Fields, resigned his office amid scrutiny from bipartisan group of senators as well as Pogo, who had arrived at the conclusion that he was not qualified for such an important position. But the fact that a replacement has not been appointed by the President, even though it has been more than a year since Fields resigned, also shows that it can be easier to create outside pressure for a removal than for an appointment, even though the impact of not having a permanent cigar is just as bad as having an ineffective cigar. Pogo strongly urges both the Obama administration and Congress to make filling all of these vacancies a priority. But we also caution that filling the vacancies quickly should not come at the expense of identifying highly qualified candidates, a process which can take time. Thank you very much for asking Pogo for our views on these important issues, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Before I recognize myself, I would ask unanimous consent that uh, two letters uh, from uh, Congressman Chaffetz, one to President Obama dated February 9, 2012, and one from uh, also to uh, President Obama dated May 17, 2011, be placed in the record, uh, both related to in, in these vacancies, without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Weins, yes. one quick question, not as a, a, a my own question, but in your opening statement you said that sometimes a vacancy can be good. I am presuming that what that really meant was sometimes creating a vacancy would be good, but retaining a vacancy is never desirable. Yeah, exactly. It is uh, the initiation of that vacancy is what good. it meant, because it creates that opportunity. No problem at all. Okay. Uh, I am going to start with uh, a question I know the answer to. It always makes it a little easier from the dais. Uh, Mr. Miller, are you familiar with uh, White House liaisons that operate within, for example, GSA? Um, generally, I have met, yes. I think, each one. Ms. Fong, you are too? Yes. And uh, Mr. Weens, are you familiar with how White House liaisons are placed in, in all the branches of the executive branch? Um, I am not as familiar. Okay. Then I will stick to my two IGs for a moment. Uh, in your experience, isn't it true that these White House liaisons regardless of who the, is in the White House, have pretty much unfettered uh, access to information that they would choose to have and the ability then to report it directly back to counsels in the White House? I, I wouldn't know, Mr. Chairman. Well, in your particular case, uh, 
the White House liaison was aware of your investigation and reported, and the Chief of Staff, actually, in this case, I believe, but reported it back to the White House counsel. So there is a separate avenue in every administration of these legislative or White House liaisons. Here is one of my, my basic questions for the two IGs. That is all well and good, but do we currently have that same level of transparency from IGs or anyone else in each of the branch, branches? We will take that as a no. Um, I am sorry, but I, I don't follow your question. Could you well, Ms. Fong, unless you report with the same specificity and, and constant reporting nature that a White House liaison does at, you name the, the ABC, uh, uh, Justice, GSA, SEC, wherever, unless we have that same level, then the White House knows an awful lot more about things that are going right and wrong, more directly and more unfettered than we do. Isn't that true? Because you are you're our only eyes and ears. We don't, we don't get to appoint a person who works for, for this branch to, to sit every day and be able to be in the critical meetings with the Cabinet officer and, and other direct staff. Isn't that true? Um, I will just say that from our perspective, we, as you know, have a statutory responsibility to report directly to you as well as the head of our agencies, and, and we f carry that responsibility out. We, we, we believe that is a very important responsibility. And that is my very question. Mr. Miller, you are a hero around here. You did a very good job uh, and continue to do a very good job in your role at GSA, and we want you to do that. But I want to make a point here today, and that was the reason for this fairly long set of questions. In the case of your recognition that there was a huge problem with the Las Vegas GSA party and, and other problems, you, you determined that and informed the White House through the, the referrals that, that GSA made directly to Consul, but not you doing it, but it, it happened as a result of your, your reporting it to the uh, to the, uh, the administrator, but also, and thus to the White House liaison, the chief of staff, and so on. But you didn't report it to us during that 10 months. The current statute would have made it a requirement, wouldn't it? Uh, not the general interpretation of the statute, but doesn't the current statute, Ms. Fong, if something is significant, significant enough that you are pre-warning uh, an administration official, you are pre-warning them because you want them to deal with it immediately, and it is, in fact, serious. Uh, doesn't that trigger the same requirement under current statute that you report to Congress? I think you have put your finger on exactly what the issue is. The language in the statute says keep the head of the agency and Congress fully and currently informed of significant issues. Um, as you noted, the practice is to work with the agencies on urgent issues immediately so that they can be addressed very quickly, and then to work with Congress as quickly as can be reasonably handled. And it does involve some discretion and some judgment. So if this committee were to send a letter uh, to Siggy, but to all the IGs, in light of the historic interpretation, and I want to be very fair, there is a historic interpretation and then there is an, uh, an interpretation that perhaps I am going to give you today from the dais. It would be my, his, my new interpretation that anything that you choose or believe you have to tell the head, formally or informally, because you believe it is significant, triggers that requirement that you also tell us in due course don't have a problem with caveats for things which have unique sensitivity, law enforcement sensitivity, but the basic we have a problem reporting, would it, would it help if uh, perhaps the ranking member and I made it clear that we believe that should trigger the information on some basis to us, Ms. Fong? Or do you need new legislative language? <laughs> which is always our backup. We always welcome legislation. No, you don't. No, all of us would prefer to work refining things without vast new laws, because we always piggyback a lot on once we get to a new law. But be, my time has run out, but could you comment on that? Sure. Um, I appreciate your comments. I am aware that there have been legislative proposals on this area, and you are aware of some of the concerns that the IG community has historically had. I think um, we should definitely have continuing dialogue with you on this and to flesh out 
areas where you have a concern where perhaps you don't believe we have been as forthcoming as you believe we should be, and I think we should continue that dialogue with you, your staff, the ranking member. Thank you. I believe we have enough time for the ranking member's questions, and then we are going to go do the votes and come back. So the gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Fong, uh, the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency issues uh, annual reports on significant activities and accomplishments of the Federal IGs. Uh, each year, your report includes data on government-wide potential savings and total savings to the government from all IG audit recommendations. Uh, can you explain the difference between potential and total savings? I think we have a chart there somewhere. Um, somebody put the chart up. There we go. Um, can you explain the difference between potential and total savings? Let me just take a step back. Okay. My, my understanding of the data, and this is based on the data that each IG office compiles in response to the IG Act requirements, um, it, and the data categories talk about potential savings because it is very difficult to measure actual savings. And so my understanding of the data that we are providing is that we, we give a number for potential savings from audits and another number for potential savings from investigations, mm -hmm. we add that up and have a total number of potential savings overall. Okay. It is very difficult to track actuals because of the nature of the criminal justice system, for example. Mm -hmm. so, you, so, but you do this report, right? It is coming out of your office, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, the Council does the report. And so your annual reports for the last five fiscal years, 2006 to 2010, show a promising trend. Is that fair to say? Um, I think you are right. I have I've looked at the results for the last three years, not the last five, because I didn't do that. But the last three do look as if we are on a very upward trend. I will note that um, a large portion of the recoveries in the last few years have been due to the Postal Service IG and some of the specific work they are doing on pensions and EBT. So let me show you the stats, okay? Mm -hmm. The graph up here shows that the potential savings for all IG recommendations and the actual savings to the government have steadily increased dramatically over the years. And I understand it is hard to get the actual number. So I guess these are pretty close estimates. Um, but no matter how you look at it, in fiscal year 2006, the potential savings were only $9.9 .9 billion, and the total savings were $16.7 billion. By fiscal year 2008, the potential savings were $14.2 billion, and the total savings went up to $18.6 billion. By fiscal year 2010, potential savings shot up to $80.2 billion, and the total savings went up to $87.2 billion. Does this appear to be accurate to you? Uh, I, I appreciate your asking me that question. Um, this is the first that we have seen the chart, and I would be very happy to take the chart and analyze it in light of the data we have and provide you some comments on it, for the record. Yeah, I guess what I am, I think that one of the things that we find is that in government today there is a lot of talk about Federal employees and you know what they don't do and what they don't accomplish, uh, and agencies that don't accomplish certain things. And when you and this committee being concerned about savings, seems like this would be something that would be at the top of of your list as far as you know what your your effectiveness at, and because that's something that we are all interested in. So, so but you're not that familiar with these charts? Is that what you are saying to me? Yes. I think generally the numbers appear to me to be accurate, but I would like to just take a closer look and get, get some comments back. But based upon what you do see, there is a positive trend going forward. Is, yes, there is a positive trend. Thank and you. And can you generally comment on why that might be, without, without even knowing all the numbers? I mean, is there something happening that we don't know about? Well, I would like to say that as, as the IG community matures and gets more experience, that we are um, getting better at identifying the issues that really require oversight and that that is showing some payoff in terms of 
dollar recoveries, as well as recommendations to improve programs. I would like to say that. Well, just say it. I will say that. <laughs> All right, you said it. <laughs> to me, it looks like both potential savings and total savings have increased dramatically under this administration. What does this say overall about the community of inspectors general under the administration? Can you comment generally on the effectiveness of the community of inspectors general and some of whom are acting? I mean, in other words, we have concerns about vacancies and whatever, but obviously uh, the actings and the people in permanent positions, apparently they are doing something significant because that is a big jump from a few years ago to, to now. Well, just to comment on the jump, again, I, I just want to reiterate that a large portion of that is due to the Postal Service IG's accomplishments. I want to give them appropriate credit. But to get to your larger point about the acting IGs and their organizations, um, I have spoken to many of them recently. All of them have told me, the ones I have spoken with, that they are going after their mission full speed ahead, that they are very proud of the accomplishments of their offices, that they feel they have issued some very hard-hitting reports with real dollar recoveries, and um, they feel that their offices continue to operate at a high professional level. Well, I would, uh, as I close, I would agree with that, and I want to publicly thank them for what they do. Um, I, don't, I think it would be almost impossible for us on this panel and this committee to effectively and efficiently do our jobs without you and without the IGs. And so, uh, with that, I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. And on that agreement, we will stand in recess until just a few minutes after the second of two votes, which means about 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.